There's a tremendous amount of anxiety in the air. You can just feel it, both in the United States and other countries. You know, we're coming post-elections, so there is a certain element of joy and euphoria by some, but there's still plenty of anxiety. In the Middle East, as the wars rage, wars rage on, on a personal note, which has affected so many of us, so many millions of us, this week, the murder, the brutal, cold-blooded murder of Rep. Tzvi Kogan in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. Tragedies like that bring out all our fears and insecurities, and especially the uncertainty of where we're headed. So, of course, we're always looking for ways and methods how to deal with anxiety. Being that we're entering into Thanksgiving, it seems appropriate to talk about gratitude. Can gratitude resolve your anxiety? Please join me. And let's explore deeper what exactly is gratitude? Beyond, of course, the nicety of it and the civility of it, how it affects us psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, and how we could see it as a tool, as an instrument that can actually help us deal with challenges, anguish, and anxiety. Hi, this is Simon Jacobson, and we'll be speaking about Can Gratitude Resolve Your Anxiety? This program is dedicated by Moshe and Rebecca Belinsky in loving memory of Moshe's grandmother, Sarah Golda Bas Zev Wolf. You could feel anxiety thick in the air. I interact with many people of all walks of life, and I can sense people are on edge. And it makes sense. You know, when you have wars raging in Ukraine, in the Middle East, when you have the political polarization in this country, and in general, there are so many moving pieces that create a lot of uncertainty. Where are we headed? Even some of the positive developments, like AI, technology, which is improving our lives, but because it opens up new panoramas that some consider to be a Pandora's box. Is it a panorama or a Pandora's box? So anything that's new is sometimes unsettling. You know, recently, well, recently this week, dealing with the tragic, brutal, cold-blooded murder of a young 28-year-old rabbi in the United Arab Emirates, Rabbi Svi Kogan, which is still so shocking. For what was he killed? A person serving a community. Traveled there simply to help people. Killed simply because he was a Jew. So that alone opens up so many questions and yet another cause for anxiety. Yet we're told, and this goes back to the miracle of human immunity that's built into our very beings, into the very cosmic system. Very fascinating Talmudic statement that God, before every illness, precedes it with a cure. The cure precedes the illness. Every challenge is preceded by all the instruments and tools and resources we need 
to deal with that challenge. So I was thinking, you know, we're entering Thanksgiving. On that, I want to say Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Thanksgiving is about gratitude. What is gratitude? What is its deeper significance? Besides the civility of it, cordiality, the right thing to do, someone does something nice for you, you say thank you. You've been blessed in some way, you show gratitude to those that have helped you. Gratitude to God for God's blessings to you or, or, how, or however you feel those blessings come to you. So it seems to be the most normal thing to do. But there's a lot more to it. And when we probe and explore the real soul, we'll call it, the anatomy of gratitude will come away with more tools and more resources to actually deal with and even resolve anxiety. Because at the end of the day, we'll start with the anatomy of anxiety. Anxiety can be dissected by a sense of unsettling, unsettling, disorientation, unsettled. You know, when things are going smoothly and you're very comfortable and you feel secure, you usually are not going to be anxious. Where does anxiety come from? When something is not working the way it should in your mind, something you expected didn't happen, something you didn't expect did happen, so it's connected to doubts, to uncertainties, to unpredictable situations, surprises. That's what happens. We human beings thrive on certain predictable situations. Security, you know where your home is, you know it. at the end of the day, no matter how hostile the environment you're in, you're going home, there's a certain comfort. Here's your room, here's your bedroom, here's your living room, here are the people you know. The coordinates of our lives are critical to keep our equilibrium. It's like being on a ship, and you know there's a captain, and you see it's going in a smooth direction. But as soon as there's a storm, especially in your comfort zone, in your hearth, in the place you should be receiving nurturing, that can be very traumatic. Look at children. Children are the best example because children are most impressionable. What can disturb the trajectory of the healthy growth of a child and security of a child is unpredictable situations. Parents get divorced. Now what do you do? And the child doesn't have all the sophisticated tools. My father is here, my mother is there. Until now, they were both under the same roof. I came home, I, I know what to expect. Now some weekends I stay here, some weekends I'm there. Or in general, when children move from one place to another, I'm not saying there's there's never a reason to do so, but a big factor has to come into play. Children need to know they come home, they know where their address is, they know where their bed is. They start moving from place to place, some type of nomadic lifestyle, you always see is going to create certain elements of insecurity and fears because you don't know what's coming next. Now, we all understand that we have to be armed to be able to deal with all situations, surprising, unexpected situations. But the more, well, the more you're prepared for it. You know, a good swimmer becomes a swimmer over time. You don't become a good swimmer immediately. It begins that you first develop secure tools, self-confidence, self-esteem. And once you do that, then you're ready to explore new terrains. Someone that's forced to explore too early and has not developed that confidence will often not succeed. So that's what's called training. That's what's called priming someone. So in our early formative years, in our educational years, children are taught how to build that type of confidence. So when they have to go out and there's a situation that may be unexpected or even disturbing or a setback, they have the resources. But if that's done too early, if a child comes out of the mother's womb too early, I don't just talk on a physiological level, on an emotional level. They're not ready yet. There's a period in our lives that we need to be completely completely engulfed, completely immersed and absorbed, absorbed completely surrounded 
by a nurturing embrace. And our early formative years, a child at home has to have a home. A bird can't fly until it has a nest. First it has a nest and slowly develops and learns from the adults the ability to go out. So anxiety will always be a result of something that was aborted or something that was severed or something that was disturbed prematurely. So what's the counterforce to that? Is to create secure foundations. So even if there has to be, something has to happen in a person's life, we need to move elsewhere for whatever reason. Good reason. Or something has to happen that's going to be somewhat unsettling. The critical thing is to create resources that counter that. It's like anything in life, like shock absorbers. If something's going to shake up, you want to have other factors that are going to somewhat brace that shock or brace the pressure or brace the, the, the collision, if you wish, to be able to counter it so it doesn't completely destroy a person's morale and psyche and overwhelm us. That's why it's so critical to have foundational, eternal values in your life. The foundation of a building is invisible. We don't see it. It's deep beneath the ground under the building. Nobody wants to live in a foundation, but without it, the building cannot stand. We look at the building, we see the cosmetics. See the different floors that are built, the furnishings. Yes, there are some foundational beams here and there, but the main thing that you see is the outer dimension. You don't see that inner foundation. Psychologically, is the same story. There's a foundation. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting statement in the Kabbalistic literature that foundations on earth are beneath the building. Foundations on the spiritual level are above the building. And it makes sense. First you begin with the foundation, and then the rest flows from there. But in this world, it's from the bottom up, so to speak. In other words, first you start with your mission statement, and then you build a company. You don't start a company and then look for a mission statement. You don't build a building and then, then build a foundation. But the foundation is actually higher conceptually because it precedes the building. Everything is built upon it. So again, down below, but it's upon literally. But above, the foundation is the higher level, and the building comes beneath it. So what are these foundations? These are eternal values. I always found it somewhat, I guess, ironic that they call financial investments securities. Remember, the prudential rock, security. If anything is insecure, it's money. Because money doesn't last. And you see how people hoard it, and you realize. Because everything in this material world is temporary, is impermanent. So how can you build real security and a foundation on something that it itself, the foundation, is wavering? So therefore, we need to look for eternal foundations. Eternal foundations are the values. Are the values upon which we build. You know, there's that uh, analogy they give professor is giving a class in time management. So he wants to make a demonstration for his class in time management, and this is what he does. Comes in one day with an assistant, an empty aquarium, with a few sacks, big sacks, puts them on the floor. He says, class, look at this aquarium. Is it full or empty? Empty, an empty aquarium. We're going to fill it up now. He opens sack number one. Sack number one, there are big boulders. Rocks puts them in as far as he can reach, that's that. Is this, ta- is, this, uh, is this tank, is this aquarium full? Well, it's full, relatively speaking. He opens sack number two, it has small pebbles. He pours the pebbles in, they fill all the crevices. And now is it full? Some say yes, well, there's a third sack. Third sack, fine gravel. Fine gravel is able to fill the spaces that the pebbles didn't fill. All the way till the top. Is it full now? So most of, the class, most of the class students said yes. A few saw another sack, so they realized something more to come. But what? Pitchers of water. And he pours in the water. So of course water is even finer than the gravel. The water spills over from the top of the aquarium. Is it full now? Everyone says yes it is. So you have the rocks. 
the small pebbles, the gravel, and the water. He says, what's the lesson we learn from this? So one student raises his hand. Very simple. He knew there was a time management class. That even when you think your day is full, there's always room to, fill, to put in something else, to schedule something else. So even though we thought it was full, you always see there's more you can add. Sounds right, with time management. The teacher, the professor says no. The lesson is that if you don't put the boulders in first, you're never going to get them in. If you started with the water, and then the gravel, and then the pebbles, you'd never get the stones in. The stones are the foundations, the values that you hold dear, that you cherish, that you cannot live without. Now, many of us take that for granted until this time of trouble or a setback. But that's the key and secret to life. All success, all security is built on those boulders, those foundations, those pillars. Often, once a person is struck by the storm, that's when we try to build our pillars. But it's very hard to build a, a, a ship, a, a strong ship, or a powerful tree in the middle of a storm. You have to prepare in the years of plenty and not take it for granted. So the first step is to write down what are those values that are indispensable, that are not optional or arbitrary. And one of them, maybe one of the big ones, is gratitude. There are others as well, obviously. But let's talk about gratitude now as a counterforce to anxiety and to the other uncertainties that can throw us, disorient us, demoralize us, unsettle us. Gratitude, in addition to obviously the obvious that it's the right thing to do, to say thank you, it also demonstrates that you're not focusing on yourself. You're not taking your gifts for granted. You don't feel a sense of entitlement. You're humbled. And you always know that you're not a self-made person. Whether it's your parents, your siblings, your friends, your educators, your community, strangers. People have helped shape who you are. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have your individuality. But you recognize that you're not this self-contained island. That is the first step toward creating something eternal. Because the ego, like money, is very temperamental and ever-changing and very insecure, frankly. What is eternal is when you give, when you show gratitude, when you thank. What you're doing in the process is understanding the bigger picture. It's not just what I've gained and what's in it for me? It's understanding that there are other people that need to be acknowledged, that we're dependent on others. It's the counterbalance to arrogance and to self contained life, or the survival of the fittest dog eats dog attitude, which may feel very comfortable for some short term and instant gratification, but it's never long term. Love. Love is essentially a form of gratitude. It's obviously more than that, but it's also, it's not about me, me, me. And seeing the other person just as an extension of yourself. That's not true love. True love is transcendent. That It's not what that person is doing for you. It's how you can go beyond yourself as you experience another person, respecting their space, their dignity, their values, their, their contributions. So another way of putting it is called transcendence. So gratitude goes into that category of values that are transcendent. And that fits the bill for a truly eternal foundation. That's why it does counter and can help resolve anxiety. Because it's taking you away from yourself. Anxiety at the end of the day, going back to what we said before, the unsettling element, the, trauma, the traumatic aspects, the unpredictability, causing that insecurity. So if it does indeed happen, what's the counterforce? What could you do? Let's say you did grow up in a broken home, and God forbid, where you didn't know where love was coming from. Or you grew up with an, a, an unhealthy parent, a dysfunctional parent, who one day could love you and the other day could hate you. Who one day could be beautiful and nurturing and the other day can be aggressive and, and violent. Alcoholic parents, 
other addictions, absentee, all these things that throw us and cause anxiety. And whatever you meet, anybody afterwards when you grow up, you don't know with where, where love is coming from. So it's distrust. All the forces that eat, eat up like a cancer, eat at our inner psyche. Yes, all the forces that contribute to anxiety and to fears and inhibitions and insecurities. So the key thing to remember, what does nurturing do for you? Why is it so vital? And why is the lack of it cause such anxiety? Because it creates that foundation for you. It gives you the foundation, something you can rely on. You know, I can always rely on this foundation of my building, of my home. If you have to question every day, will this foundation crumble? Or maybe it's not going to hold up the building. Maybe it's not going to nurture and love me. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to constantly be in fear. When is the next earthquake happening? When is the next explosion or eruption? So what's the counterforce to that type of insecurity is building security. Building security means get yourself out of your own way. Don't allow ego to be in place because at the end of the day, what's happening is, is that your ego becomes also very self-protective now because I have to save myself. You know, people in the flight or fight mode, they're always on alert, always the antenna up. There's no comfort because I don't know what the future holds. I don't know who's my real friend, who can I rely on, who can I trust. Gratitude, among other similar virtues, introduces transcendence, something beyond yourself. That beyond that you should have had when you were a child, that would have given you that love and that foundation, you now need to create. And you create it one way is through showing thank you, through expressing thank you, showing gratitude. Obviously, love, healthy love, should be on that list. Trust, kindness, empathy, well, we're focused on gratitude, but you'll see the common, the common denominator between all of them is transcendence. Transcendence from the, of the temporal, of the impermanent, of the forces that don't create security, but create the opposite of that. They create insecurity and hence anxiety. So when you think of it that way, yes, thanksgiving, saying thank you, showing gratitude, is a tremendous gift a tremendous tool. Now we should do so even if it doesn't have the psychological benefits, simply because it's the right thing to do. But imagine the, when you understand the benefits from it. It's like oxygen. You need to breathe. You can't just inhale. You also need to exhale. It can't just be about you, me taking in air. You need to give out. You can't just contract. It has to also expand your heart. That's what a heartbeat is. Life is that give and take. You're breathing. There's a rhythm. The Kabbalists call it tension and resolution. Ratzay and Shuv. There's a yearning, a longing, and then there's integration. It's the secret to life. And anyone living in the moment and just trying to say, let me just hold on to what I have, ultimately it's going to backfire. You need those eternal values. When you see people who naturally say thank you, show kindness, gratitude, and often that comes from their childhood, or maybe you've developed it, there's a certain refinement about it. There's a certain vibe that even comes. You know, you see it, someone says thank you to you, tell me how you feel. You always feel good. And I don't mean feel good in a superficial way. You feel acknowledged, you feel dignity, you feel uh, respected. And when someone doesn't know how to do that, there's a certain element. I mean, we could override. We're human beings. We're resilient. But there's something lacking. The circle is not complete. The breath is not complete. The exhale and inhale didn't happen completely. A person received and they didn't give back. And I don't mean in a reciprocal way, in the sense, tit for tat. Just the healthy balance, the healthy cross-pollination, the healthy interconnectivity between life, which is so vital to, to the environment, to nature, to the human body. The human body is saying thank you to each other all the time. Not necessarily with those words, but there's a certain acknowledgement. 
as one valve opens and another closes, as they interact with each other, as one does their part in the assembly line, whether it's digestion or respiratory or the nervous system or the circulatory system or the neurological system. The list goes on. So it's time to align ourselves to those rhythms. That's why Thanksgiving, yes, I know it's become commercial, has all kinds of other superficial aspects to it, but that's why it has that power, because it reminds us. And remember, the idea goes back thousands of years. Simple thank you. In the morning we say, Moda'ani, I talk about this prayer, thank you for returning my soul to me. Every morning say that. It's a powerful meditation, a powerful thought. Firstly, gratitude. Second of all, it focuses on life. Where life begins, your soul, not your body. Not the temporary, but the permanent. So yes, it's not just the saying thank you, it's the attitude of gratitude that can resolve anxiety. Does it mean it's going to automatically eliminate negative experiences in life, challenges, setbacks, tragedies? No. But it definitely helps you navigate them. Definitely helps you Maneuver helps you ride above those waves even when the storms come. We should only be blessed with beautiful experiences. And then also say thank you. You don't have to wait for a negative to remind you. Build those eternal foundations. Make a list of these eternal values. That's what helps us ride through the vicissitudes of the temporary and impermanent world in which we live. And where we can actually Fuse the eternal into the moment. Infinity into the finite. Thank you so much. Happy Thanksgiving. This has been Simon Jacobson of Meaningful Life Center. MeaningfulLife.com. Please subscribe to our offerings, to our growing YouTube channel that cover and address really every topic that is relevant to us. Please share with others. And of course, always love and welcome your feedback, your thoughts, your comments, your insights. Be blessed and be well. May we have many things to thank for, many blessings to be thankful for, and always acknowledge those blessings. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com slash donate.